Well, I'm going to start with a question. Who said this? As a microcosm of what we hope to achieve, look at the Olympics and their legacy. We have set ourselves the goal of convergence. The idea is that kids growing up in East London should have the same life chances as anywhere else. There's no reason why the kids of East London should not benefit from, say, rugby as much as the kids from Richmond. After two hours of hard physical exercise, such as scrumming and tackling around the ankles, a 16-year-old is much less likely to want to get into a gang fight. Oh. Got it in one. I knew Mark would get it anyway. <laughs> <coughs> I couldn't do the accent, I'm afraid, and I haven't got the hairstyle to go with it. But, so. Anyway, who else? Yeah. It seems to me the Olympic Games are unique uh, amongst sporting, mega sporting events, not just because of the scale of the infrastructure, investment, and the impact on host cities, not even because of the scope of media attention, which of course provides an unparalleled platform for the promotion of carnival capitalism under the banner of national and civic ambition. Rather, the Games are invested with a peculiar prospect of hope for a world in which the idealism of youth as captured by sport prevails over geopolitical conflict. That's the prospect and a prolonged retrospect in which their legacy, the material and social benefits supposedly accruing to those communities, is subject to a combination of intensive short-term monitoring, as we just heard from Alan Brimcombe, and long-term collective amnesia. How is it possible to create a post-Olympics in which, which is neither a simple material trace of a historical event, the 2012 Games, or a sentimental retrieve of a liminal moment of national triumphalism celebrated in the ceremonies and the team's uh, UK's crop of golds, nor a reiteration of an original compact with the host city struck in the heat of the bid, but which has long since lost any rhetorical purchase it once had on its citizens. It's characteristic of any post-Olympic city that it remains haunted by extravagant promises of regeneration and by the disappointment that inevitably comes with the discovery that it's indeed impossible to live the dream. And if we can, I don't know, if we, can we get it full so we can get to... Uh, yeah, okay. Let me just, just, yeah. So here's, here's a little bit of the dreamscape. Uh, can I do it from here? Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Oh, okay. You see, I'm not really good with the technology stuff. So here's just a, a few uh, images from the dreamscape, uh, the uh, the bid, uh, and how the dream were actually taken up is, uh, from a project done in a primary school. And there, there's a little bit more of the dream. That's new and winning the Olympics. Everyone's a winner. And it carries on into the ceremonies. And here's my moment of fame. I get to meet Tessa Sanderson. Uh, you'll note we're carrying the torch. The torch is pointing downwards to see what's happening next, not upwards. Right, so there's the dream. Um, and of course, as Boris Johnson uh, puts it, um, the natural tendency of kids in East London to riot will be curbed by the fact that we derive as much benefit from hard rugby practice as their peers attending private schools in Richmond. So I think as they say, they lol, you know, which is London Olympic lies. Now, the idea is that in a society where structural inequalities are intensifying, and partly as a direct result of government policies, the, the fact, the idea that the Olympic legacy could create a bubble of pros prosperity which, in which this trend is locally reversed is clearly just magical thinking. Um, you might say it takes our, um, our leading Brexiteer to give it a probably farcical twist in an old Etonian injunction to the lower orders to play up and play the game. In the context of the EU referendum, indeed we've seen London 2012 being referenced um, you know, by the, the Leave campaign uh, in an extraordinary exercise in smug self-congratulation, arguing that 2012 proved that Britain could put on a successful show as a standalone nation, open to the world, united in a spirit of enterprise that had once upon a time, in other words, before we acceded to the EU, made us great. So here we have an example of post-imperial nostalgia, which was only evoked uh, ironically in the, in the Olympic opening ceremonies, thanks to Danny Boyle's sort of double take on it, actually making a come comeback bid in a retrospective claim that the game prefigured a collective desire to reinvent the island story. So that's in a way is how the, the legacy is being kind of recycled and, and, and rebranded. In more general terms, I mean, my take on Olympics is that they are a tragicomic spectacle. It's a spectacle of a huge, 
human enterprise. I'm involving tens of thousands of people, millions of pounds, enormous technologies, and so forth, which destroys itself as it becomes mired in sordid political machinations and bureaucratic mechanisms of public unaccountability, not to mention doping scandals. It's a dream machine that all too readily becomes a nightmare for those whose population, in whose name and for whose benefit the exercise has been conducted. And we've been hearing a lot about what that nightmare might consist of. And I think it's kind of hopeful that increasingly citizens of potential host cities are saying no to bidding. The games are not worth the candle they light for carnival capitalism. This is what it means to live the Olympic dream, to remain permanently poised between a utopian project demanding the impossible and the repression of hopes and desires for a better world that it evokes. And I think that split, I think, is also linked to a disjuncture between pre- and post-Olympic time, because the, the pre-Olympic time is kind of flooded with high anxiety and anticipation, and the post-Olympic time is this interminable fading of horizons of possibility. Will the 2012 Games finally be over in 2020 or 2050, or whenever some legacy body decides to call the whole, to the whole, the whole proceedings? And this split temporality has its spatial correlate in this corporate in imagineering that conjures up an area of urban dereliction, in other words, Stratford's environs, in desperate need of large-scale regeneration in order to project onto it a futuristic scenario of magical transformation. Now, what I want to argue is that if the post-Olympic post urban studies has a properly comparative frame, you know, we're able to compare what happened in London 2012 with what happened, just happened in Rio or what happens in Tokyo and so on, then we have to find a way conceptually to move more fluently between the Olympic bid as a civic compact, games time as a sporting spectacle, and legacy as a network material and social infrastructure. And we have to consider each of those moments, each instances, from both a local and global perspective. In fact, those, those terms involve a rather complicated set of negotiations between public bodies, private interests, and the political representatives of communities in, 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 that are actually uh, evoked as beneficiaries. Each host city convenes a unique configuration of those elements, which come together around a contested promise and process of regeneration. And we've been hearing a lot about the nature of that process, or at least some instances of it. The post-Olympic is about the transition of the legacy narrative from the realm of the social imaginary to putative and contested social fact. It's also about how the narrative legacy of a games becomes embedded in the official memory scape through the intervention of Olympic heritage and research industries that are working away all the time to establish the reputation of position and identity of a particular games in the kind of lead table. You know, where are we in relation to um, Barcelona is always the one to beat, isn't it? But the, the, the Olympic games are continually being rerun uh, in, this, in this kind of uh, lead table manner. Now, to grasp what is actually happening in the legacy, I think we need a more sophisticated theory of legacy transitions, so that its different moments can be grasped not as freeze frames, but as, as a, a, a process of an unfolding like dialectic, but it's not a tele teleological process, not something that's kind of uh, led by you know, the original plan. How is the original plan unfolding? which would be a teleological model. We see it as a set of moments of different uh, sites of contestation, different moments of contestation. So, for example, transition can be a matter of transference, the transference of assets and functions from one regime of envisionment to another, also a carryover of structures of feeling, of hope or pessimism associated with them. So that's the kind of transference model of legacy transition. It can be a, more a question of translation, in which something is both lost and gained through the shift in discursive idiom or material mise en scène. Or again, there's another possibility, it could be a case of transvaluation, which fundamentally reconfigures the meaning and weight of some elements of the Olympic compact while conserving its underlying structure. Or finally, it could be simply a matter of erasure, the bulldozing of one set of principles and priorities and their replacement by another. Two minutes, my God. Right, so, different models of, of, uh, of transition, which I think we need. Um, and just to give you a lead-in to what Debbie's going to be talking about, um, it's a bit more about the Dreamscape. And this is uh, an installation uh, in East Village, which is a rather interesting uh, double-take on what it's about. We were basically looking at 
the um, residents, the East Village residents' experiences of moving into East Village. So we did several projects, um, multi-method projects to engage residents and local people to see what they thought, but today I'm going to talk about these, the first three because that's what I was involved with, which was um, 40 in-depth interviews largely with the residents of East Village. I did ethnographic photography, so I photographed it over the year, but I also engaged with residents for them to take their own pictures um, to talk about what they thought about East Village. Okay, so first of all, representation, um, as you know, we've sort of got from the talks today, you know, this right from the bid for the games, this is a place that has been kind of uh, hugely represented before it even existed, uh, before anyone moved in. There's a massive amount of representation about the Olympics uh, space and East Village. And interestingly, this award, which was uh, one best new place to live, actually was awarded in February 2014. Um, but the first residents only moved in in November 2013, and so there was really, and, and, and to, in total there's um, about 6,000 residents, but at this stage there was probably about 100 residents living there. So it actually won this award for best new place to live when really there was very few people, even, even when we got there in October 2014, there was really very, very few residents at that stage had moved in. So apart from anything else, um, what we wanted to do was produce a kind of counter-representation and get representation, if you like, from below, from the people that were living there um, to counter this kind of mass amount of official celebratory imagery. So this is some examples of the participants' images that they took. They had themes like home, um, at the everyday, um, this is, these are the kind of things that they noticed or were important to them um, and kind of shows some sense of how they felt or saw um, this new place that they lived in. Okay, so um, thinking, so that was a way, if you like, of including, including the residents' perspective. So now thinking about um, who lived there. Okay, so as it's been stated, um, 51% uh, was is private rented. Okay, there's nearly 3,000 uh, uh, apart apartments, properties there. 51% are private rented, and 49% is what is called social housing. But actually, it's only it's 24% of the total, uh, which is actual social housing at social housing rents, um, and the rest of that 49% is shared ownership or or affordable intermediate rent um, but nevertheless um, whilst it's not you know it's not a massive proportion of social housing it's a lot more than in any of the other developments that are coming into the Olympic Park any of the other residential developments so it's a much higher proportion um, than what is coming um, so it's something okay and for some people um, you know, this was hugely important. For some people, it did transform their lives. Uh, for for uh, Nadia there, she's disabled. She lived in a maisonette. She basically couldn't go downstairs. She, it, she lived upstairs. Her whole family, uh, the kitchen and the, and the social space was downstairs. And she lived like that for several years, kind of locked up in, in her bedroom, really, away from her family. So moving to East Village for her was, you know, transformed her life. She basically got a flat. Everything's on the same level. She can live with her family again. She can share the space. She can, she can eat with her children and be a parent again. So, you know, for some people that did access these flats, it was, you know, hugely transformed their lives. Um, but, uh, you know, as it's been suggested by some other people, what came up through the narratives, um, you know, I got from the narratives that, they, that, that there was this sense of selection about who was, who was allowed to live in East Village. I mean, clearly for the intermediate rent, which was the higher related to market rent, people were assessed very carefully on their incomes. But even for the social housing, um, people talked about... So, for example, um, I mean, there was a proportion of people from East London, but not everyone by any means had come from East London in the social housing. So, armed forces priorities. Uh, Mike there, he'd, um, he was in the armed forces. He wasn't from East London, but he's ex-armed forces, so he was prioritised. Um, there was another single parent there, and she lived in East London, and she didn't... Um, she lived at... Her flat was OK. I mean, she lived uh, with her daughter, um, but she didn't like it that much. It was, um, you know, a bit dirty and noisy and she didn't like the neighbours that much. And she was on a transfer list. 
and she got a place in East Village, okay, and she worked, right? So she basically got, got a place ahead of all these people on the waiting list that didn't have any proper accommodation, even though she did actually have a home, she just got a better home, and they definitely, it was the fact that she was employed, and they even said to her, if you know any other people who were employed, and you know, she had a good rent record, so this is obviously personal narratives, but it's obviously clearly was a kind of sense of selection and who was um, going to live there. Okay, so moving on to community. Okay, so to, thinking about community within East Village itself, um, not outside East Village. Yes, there was a sense of um, pioneer community and there was a sense of a mixed community. There was lots of stuff set up by the housing providers, the official people, events, and there was a lot of self setting up of events and groups. Um, and they were, you know, to an extent, they were cross class, cross, cross ethnicity. Um, you know, so that was, there was definitely something kind of happening there. Um, interestingly, uh, part of the, uh, when, they, the, when it was all set up, um, there was a space allocated for community rooms, but actually, even still, they have not managed to negotiate um, the lease conditions about this community space. So whilst there should have been a community centre from the beginning, there's still no community space. Um, okay. So moving on to, I feel I've missed a bit, but I think it's coming. Um, Sorry. Okay, so quickly moving on to thinking about the Paralympic legacy, um, which, which was touched on in, in the lecture. And quite a few of the people I, I talked to were people with disabilities. And first of all, about the public space. Everyone who used a wheelchair or some kind of mobile scooter reported that the space itself was fantastic. It was brilliantly accessible. They didn't have to plan ahead like... Normally, they have to research, are there going to be stairs, am I going to be able to move around if I go anywhere else in London? But actually, this space, you know, everybody reported to me that it's a brilliant space to move around. It's well lit, people feel safe. Um, the sporting facilities are very kind of well set up for disabled people. Um, on the other hand, inside the flats, that's quite interesting because there were flats that were designated as um, being adapted for people with disabilities. And some of the adaptations were pretty good, like in the bathrooms, they had quite good adaptations. Uh, but there were some fundamental things missing, like one thing that was in all the flats I went in, uh, people who were in wheelchairs, the cupboards had been built high, so you couldn't access them from the wheelchair. So if you could manage to get yourself out and sort of stand up, that was okay. Uh, but for some people, they couldn't do that, okay? And, and, and none of them, I mean, they'd all obviously gone back to the housing providers to try and, both of the different kind of housing providers to try and get um, cupboards put in at, at, at the right level, but the, with no success whatsoever. And the other major problem was a couple of people I spoke to had problems actually getting in and out of their flats. And um, again, um, Nadia here, this is basically a communal door, so it's like in the block, so you go in the main entrance and then you've got this communal door that you need to get through. So she can get out of her flat fine, because she can sort of push her way out, but she can't get back in her flat. So she either has to phone a neighbour or she has to wait for someone to come back. Okay, which is really frustrating and very, very, can be very, very distressing. Um, so the time that I was there for about a year, um, she tried, we tried, Lots of people we know um, tried to get her, you know, to go to the housing provider that was triathlon and say, can you sort this out? You just need, a, you need an electronic thing set up. And they said, no, we haven't got any money, we can't sort it out. And um, she wasn't even able to get a charity to provide the money for it because it was a communal space and it was some legal insurance thing. So basically, she's, as far as I know, she's still in this situation where she can't actually get back into her flat and then uh, this other person here who lived in intermediate housing which is the slightly lower market rate housing she got the flat um, she was working she got the flat she lived there with her son he went to the local school job of manor um, and then she got some very serious health problems and she wasn't able to work anymore 
Um, so to cut a bit of a long story short, basically, intermediate, I mean, I looked it up because I found it so unbelievable what she told me. Um, she was not allowed by the terms of her lease um, to claim housing benefit. So intermediate housing, okay, intermediate, what's called intermediate housing. And I look, it isn't just her, it isn't just East Village. I looked up the East Thames uh, website, I looked at other housing providers, and as far as I can see, all intermediate um, rent, housing, you're not allowed to claim housing benefits. So in other words, it is not protecting people when they get ill, lose their jobs. And actually East Village was a very young demographic, you might have heard about that. Um, I mean, not saying there weren't some older people, but there was a lot of young people in, in, the, in the private rented. And I think that's very interesting because uh, I mean, actually, social housing people are more protected, but once you're in the intermediate housing, it's a bit like, well, once you haven't got the money, you're not even allowed to claim housing benefits. So she basically was evicted. She grew up in East London. She's worked all her life with communities in East London, um, but she's now living miles out of London. Um, public space. Is that two minutes or five yeah, minutes? Two, two minutes. OK, I'll try and be a bit quicker. Um, Public space, most of these are the residence images. It shows that they do use the public spaces. It shows which bits of the public spaces they valued. Um, there's certainly community infrastructure that they use. Um, it, obviously, I wasn't, I wasn't researching. Uh, I was researching the residents. I don't know how much other people use these spaces. It's almost so well catered for that a lot of people there said that they didn't go to Stratford. In fact, some of them refer to it as the dark side. Um, they talked about it being a bit of a bubble, so they'd get on the train and they go into London a lot, so they use that. But quite a lot of people actually didn't go, if you like, to the other side. Um, retail spaces um, in East Village um, are expensive. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of independent, independent retail outlets. Uh, which are very nice, but even the people with money commented on the fact that the people without money didn't access them very easily. Um, okay, so the question of you know who 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 accesses this this legacy space? So these are some of the pictures I took, particularly at the beginning when I didn't know anyone. I was just sort of photographing the environment, and obviously what you'll see and what you'll know if you've walked around there is that it's got a lot of empty space. Well, it's very spacious. It doesn't feel like Stratford. Um, so I think what the f these photographs do, that you know, they're not like hard data, but they raise questions about, well, where are all the people? Where are all the people um, that the legacies uh, promised to help? Um, and when we had an exhibition of, uh, we had an exhibition of all the images in, we had it in um, East Village and we had it in Stratford. Okay, so in East Village, E20, in each place we put this massive uh, piece of paper and put, what do you think of the Olympic legacy? Because we were trying to get in views. I was trying to get in the views of, of, of as much as I could of the local population. In, in both cases, the views were mixed, but this represents the primary viewpoint. So in E20, in other words, in East Village, this was the kind of feel of this, what I call graffiti wall. Okay, and in um, Stratford, we went to Stratford Library, so E15, um, this was the kind of dominant feel, um, i.e. it's not for us, we haven't really benefited from it. Um, concluding thoughts? I didn't want to repeat myself, so just to say, you know, obviously it's still in the making. Um, I think what's really, what's going to be really important to note is at the moment there is this kind of mixed community, it's a sense of cross ethnicity, class, etc. But you're getting all these new residential developments which are far and by and large private in one way or the other. So the so the demographic is gonna the proportions, uh, the socioeconomic of the socioeconomic groups, the distribution is going the proportions are going to change massively. You're gonna get a far higher proportion of wealthy people than you've got just in East Village itself. Um, so this is something to be watched. Um, question, we know there's really long waiting lists in Europe, so how is that going to be addressed by these new residential developments? I hope it's a, not just a rhetorical question. Um, and then the other question that was raised kind of by the images, how do non-East Villagers experience the Olympic Park space? 
Thank you very much.